Now, before we get into today's content, I want to welcome you to the TechSoup Global Network, especially for those of you who are new with us here today, a very, very strong welcome to all of you. So at TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training and more have the power to help fight food security. And today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos are going to give you a good taste of what this all looks like in action. But first, I'm honored to welcome our distinguished guest speaker who's going to share her thoughts and experiences on food security innovation. We're fortunate to be joined by Amanda Namayi, is the Go Getas lead for Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. The Go Getas are the largest pan African community of young agri food entrepreneurs. Amanda's role is a pioneering role to grow and curate the Go Getas Africa community. And she sits at the heart of efforts to inspire and promote a new generation of Africans that can drive growth, innovation, and job creation in the agri-food sector. Welcome, Amanda. We are delighted you're here with us today to share more about your work in food security. Take it away. Thank you, Nicole. Greetings to everyone who has joined in. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are. As Nicole introduced me, my name is Amanda Namai. I am dialing in from Nairobi, Kenya. Now, my journey in agriculture started way back when I was a little girl. My father is a farmer. And the farmer story in Africa in general is not necessarily your most motivational story. So when I went through school, I studied IT because it was a budding industry then, but God had his ways. My first assignment was to do field work at the farm because I was doing a study on smallholder access to finance and how technology could bridge that gap. So in order for me to understand the landscape, I had to immerse myself into the lifestyle of a smallholder farmer. And once I started going to the fields and and going around the country, yeah, it it all came back to me again that indeed, if I'm to use it, to use my skill in a particular area or industry, I would, agriculture is the place for me. And more so, I was drawn towards youth engagement in agriculture because I realized that there are not too many young people in agriculture. And that being said, when I transitioned to the Alliance for Green Revolution Revolution in Africa, as go-getters lead, it was a role befitting for what I really love because in Africa, youth make up the largest demographic of close to 60% of Africa's population. And with this growing number of Africa's people, we need to feed them. And also Africa feeds the world. We have... 60% of sub-Saharan Africa is arable land. So how are we going to engage the young people to adopt agriculture? And it's not necessarily in production, but other auxiliary fields and services such as tech, which had long been forgotten. And working with the young people has shown that they are creative solutions, such as the go-getters. And as you have described, one of our finalists from 2020, owns a drone system, integrated aerial systems, where they use drones to spray crops, be it with pesticides or uh, with other chemicals. So we see tech coming in to leverage and improve production in agriculture, whereas making it attractive for young people to engage and contribute towards SDG2 of zero hunger. So that is what I'll have to say. I wouldn't want to take too much time. I'd also love to hear from the fellow panelists on how tech is contributing towards food security. And over to you, Nicole. Amanda, thank you so much for being with us, for sharing that perspective. Africa truly does feed the world and we're grateful to have those insights and for you just to join in and be part of this conversation with us here today. Thank you again. All right, and now, I'm very excited to welcome and introduce today's Public Good App House presenters and their smart solutions to reduce hunger and eliminate waste. With us today, we have Kamali Jennings with Share the Meal from the United Nations World Food Program, Josh Dominguez with Flash Food, 
Justin Block from Feeding America, Tom Dooner with Code for America, and Jonathan Sue from Open Mule. So wherever you are, let's give them a round of snaps for being here with us today. And a reminder that we will be sharing the replay from today's event. I know you're going to want to go watch this, or if you have to, for some reason, leave this event. We know life happens, especially in this remote work world we're living in. So do not worry. We will be sharing the replay with everyone who has signed up for this event. And you'll also be able to share that replay with anyone who you think would have loved to be here and watch this event. So yes, look out for the replay, the slides, and any resource links that we share with you. It will be sent to you via email within the next couple days. And again, just a reminder that this event is only as good as the engagement that we get from all of you. So share your reactions in chat, ask questions in the Q&A section. I already see some really good ones. A reminder that you can upvote for your favorite ones to float those to the top. And then tweet at us. We're at the hashtags food apps and public good app house. And you can see a really fantastic stream of what people are sharing. So do check that out as well. And a Reminder, we will have time at the end of the panelist demos at the very end after everyone goes to answer your questions. So do stick around. Okay, let's get going here. So first up, we've got Connelly Jennings. She leads partnerships for Share the Meal, the mobile fundraising app from the United Nations World Program. And this app allows users to share their meal with a hungry child with just a tap and 80 cents, feeding one child for a day. So let's hear more from Kamale. Welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. So happy to be here amongst amazing uh, panelists. So what is Share the Meal? As you mentioned, we are the mobile fundraising app from the United Nations World Food Program. So if you head to the next slide, we'll show a bit about what is the UNWFP. The power to end hunger lies in the palm of your hand. Share the Meal, as I said, is part of the World Food Program. I'm very, very proud and humble to say that the World Food Program, or WFP, as you may have heard, was awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize this past year in 2020. Um, we're so humbled and grateful for this honor and really to, to shed light on our platform and, and what we do. We're the world's largest humanitarian organization addressing hunger. Our mandate is to feed hungry people around the world. We assist 100 million people in 88 countries a year. If you head to the next slide, you'll show that, as, you, as I said earlier, Share the Meal allows millennials, people like you and I, to give back and help those in need. Next, 80 cents, $80 cents can feed one child for just one day. What is Share the Meal? We have Apple and Google Pay integrated, monthly subscriptions, team giving, gifting meals. We're truly a global app. Our team is based in Germany. I'm here in the Bay Area, but our team is based in Germany and we're available in 14 languages, 30 currencies, really around the world. So, so what we're here to do is really break the mold of traditional giving. No longer do you need to you know, drop coins into a bucket or, or write a check to give back, but you can do it just with a tap on your smartphone. Next. So this is a perfect, actually, just see what kind of meals do you feed the recipients? Perfect question uh, to segue into is how do we operate? We operate on a rotational basis. So we support WFP's beneficiaries. So we work with anywhere between two to five, I would say, different fundraising campaigns per month in the app. And so once we reach a specific target in a specific location, we move on to the next. Oftentimes we support WFP's most critical operations. So natural disasters, conflict-ridden areas, areas where uh, food is just too expensive for beneficiaries to, to purchase. And so proud to say that to date over, this is actually outdated as of yesterday, over 96 million meals have been shared to date since our launch just five and a half years ago. 4. million users, vast majority uh, are actually millennials. Next. Um, also proud to say that we do have a robust marketing team. We're an app. And so we do work on traditional app 
media and app, uh, advertising and engagement. So we're, we're very grateful to be working with Google and, Apple, Google and Apple to have editorial features such as for Ramadan or the holidays to really engage users during that, that time period and, and how, how to give back. We also are, are proud to say that we were one of Apple's best top apps of the year last year, top 15 apps, as well as Google. And so we, we have all of our tech is actually in-house. Majority of our team is, is tech and product. And so, and that's something that has always occurred for Share the Meal. And so we're a tech driven product first startup within the UN that I think really gives us that edge and has helped us become so successful over these past four years. Next. Oh yes, here we are. Very, very proud to see an actual signature uh, from Tim Cook, uh, which was really exciting earlier to, to receive that award. Uh, next. Here's our tech stack. As uh, Nicole mentioned, I'm uh, the, the partnerships manager, so not an engineer, but here's our tech stack. Everyone is in-house design, UI UX is in-house, and, and we're so fortunate to have such a, a strong team based in Berlin to, to be working on this app around the clock. <laughs> Next. And this is the app. So available on both Android and iOS devices. The first screen you see here is what, look, what it looks like when you open the app. So this is one of the locations that you can share a meal for. As I mentioned, this rotates every few months. Right now you can help refugees who have fled Ethiopia recently. Um, you can see the progress of our meal goal. And then if you see the next uh, photo, it's how you can feed a child for one day. So the, the initial price point is $80. And that actually moves up to an unlimited amount. So you can give uh, as much as you'd like via Apple Pay, Google Pay, PayPal, or credit card. So we're trying to make things very, very accessible. And then the third step, which I would say is probably my favorite part and, and the best part, is a thank you message. Is what is your impact of that shared meal? You know, if you give to a refugee who's fled Ethiopia, what does that mean for that child or that family? You know, how much of an impact can your 80 cents really make? And next. And yes, I think that's really share the meal in a nutshell. Uh, like I said, the app is free to download. We are from the United Nations World Food Program. And so we're here to be very transparent and an easy way for, for you to fight hunger together with us. Thank you. Excellent. Right on, Kamale. Thank you so much for, for sharing that and uh, some really good call to actions. We're going to get to some more call to actions at the end of um, our time together. So, you know, another reason to stick around, uh, to continue to feel motivated by all this inspiring information that we're hearing today. All right, up next, and a reminder, tweet at us, we're at TechSoup and the hashtags food apps and public good app house with your cool learnings. So now we're going to bring on Josh Dominguez. Josh is the founder and CEO of Flash Food. It's a mobile marketplace helping retailers reduce their food waste and feed people affordably. He founded Flash Food in 2016 after reading about the environmental effects of food waste. And food, Flash Food rather, doubles down on using food to do good. So what does that mean? That means rescuing food that can be used to help feed those in need or unable to afford fresh and healthy food options such as those as Flash Food provides. So let's hear more about Flash Food by welcoming Josh to the screen here. Welcome, Josh. And hey, Nicole. Thanks for having me. And, and I guess to start, I feel really humbled to be in the group of people that, that are speaking today because both Kamala and Amanda listening to the two of you, I was like, wow, this is, it's just cool to be here and, and for everybody here to be working on what they're working on. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to tell the story about Flash Food and how we're solving things. Initially, the way that I'm going after and our company is going after this problem, food waste and food insecurity is really difficult, obviously, and it's going to take a lot of stakeholders to solve so many different ways. We thought that we would focus specifically on the grocer and helping them create a revenue stream so that we can save people money and also reduce food waste at the store level. So my name is Josh. I'm the founder of Flash Food. And Nicole, if you could just hit next slide. So 30 to 40% of food produced around the world goes to waste. Crazy stat is when food gets thrown out, it usually ends up in a landfill, gets covered by their garbage, when it rots, doesn't have oxygen, and that produces methane gas. So the statistic is if international food waste were a country, it'd be the third leading cause of greenhouse gas emission behind the US and China. When I learned that, I wanted to zero in on grocery 
And the average grocery store in North America throws out between five and $10,000 worth of food a day. And it's usually three days to sometimes weeks before the sell-by date. And the issue is not just the retailer based, it's also consumers. When we go grocery shopping, we're reaching at the back for whatever has the longest shelf life and the near dated stuff moves to the front. So what that does is it means we don't pick it. So the grocer has to pull it off in advance. And it's just this really difficult problem to solve. If you wanna donate all that food, who picks it up, who drops it off, who pays the price, who guarantees the safety? Really, really difficult. So the idea that we had, and if you wanna hit next slide, Nicole, is if there's a way for the store to mark the price of the food down, send me a notification to my phone, I could see it through my phone, pay through my phone and pick it up in the store that same day. People would shop like that all the time. And that's basically what we, what we built. We took the discount food rack, made it look sexy, put it on your cell phone. So next slide, Nicole. And the way that that works is the grocer, instead of scanning that product and bringing it to the back and throwing it out or whatever they're gonna do with it, Usually it's stuff that gets thrown out because it's fresh food that doesn't have a lot of shelf life. Instead of throwing it out, they scan it into our app and they leave it in our, fra our flash food fridge right beside customer service. We send a notification out to our users. They see the deal through their phone, pay through their phone, and they come pick the food up that day at the store. And the discount is usually in and around 50% off. And then to give people an idea, it, the tech stack, it's a native iOS, we use Swift, and on Android, we're using Kotlin and Java, and then the back end is in Node.js. Next slide. And why this is so important of a solution is because we're targeting specifically the grocer. So we have to create value for the grocer. And to date, we've sold over 80% of all the food they make available that they would have otherwise thrown out. The average basket size is about 10 to $15 on discounted stuff through us. And when they get to the store, these consumers are spending 20 or $30 on full price food when they're at the store, which benefits the grocer. And then what's important from an environmental perspective is we've helped grocers reduce over 15 million pounds of, of food waste from landfill now alone. And that number's growing quickly. Next slide. It, so I'm based in Toronto. We're a Canadian company. We've rolled out across, across Canada. And now where we're at in our growth is we're scaling across Northeastern states in America. So Myers coming on board and rolling out Spartan Nash tops, giant, giant Eagle is going to come online. Like we're now just starting to add different partners across America. But to give you an idea with just one partner, we went from 10 stores to over 400 stores in the span of a year and sold over 80% of the food that they were going to throw out and drove in about 30% net new customers. So the value prop for us to the grocer is we're creating this new revenue stream for you. And then from the consumer side, we're helping them save over 50% on their groceries. And next slide, Nicole. This is some of our scale, some of our partners. Next slide. The most meaningful thing about what we're doing now, like I said at the start, we're solving food waste at different in different ways, solving food insecurity in different ways. What's been really impactful for us is our main shoppers, typically young mothers with with young families. And if you took our top customer and you looked at their savings on a yearly basis, these people are saving tens of thousands of dollars on their groceries. So we solve the food waste problem specifically with grocers and give a value prop to, to consumers to save money for stores that they were going to go to. Certainly not the only solution, certainly probably not the biggest that we have right now. But as we build out the marketplace, we're looking to actively add on not for profits, food pantries, like there's a way to make this work as we continue to scale. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that at the end when we get questions. That's it for me. Really appreciate being here. I think that this is amazing for everybody on the call. Thank you for the work you're doing because these problems are so difficult and so important to solve. Josh, thanks so much. That's right. And that's why we're all here. We're coming at it from, from different uh, practices, different ways. And so together, we've got some really great solutions. So thanks for that. Okay. And speaking next is Justin Block. Justin is Managing Director of Digital Platform Technology, joining who joined Feed America, the nation's largest domestic hunger relief and food rescue organization about seven years ago. He leads the team that developed Meal Connect, which he's going to talk about today, the country's first nationally available food rescue app. And today it's connected almost 3 billion donated meals with people who need them most. All right, Stage, 
<laughs> meant to say the stage is yours, Justin. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much. <clears throat> hey, everybody. I'm Justin Block. I am from Feeding American. I'll talk about Meal Connect today. But before I do, I I'm just so humbled by my co-panelists and the introductory speaker. I mean, we're all here for the same reasons and to hear um, other people talk about their approach to solving these large issues is inspiring. So, so I'm, I'm pleased to be with you all and pleased to see uh, a couple of familiar names in the um, chat as well. So with that, next slide. So Meal Connect, as mentioned, is the first nationally available food donation app where food businesses anywhere in the country can post a donation to Meal Connect using the website or the smartphone app. And even trucks hauling rejected loads can be routed to the, near, to the nearest Feeding America food bank to donate their surplus food. So, you know, picture a, a, a local um, restaurant or, or a grocery store, convenience store, can go to Meal Connect, post a donation, they enter in information about it, an email gets generated to the local Feeding America food bank, and they can take action. In addition to that, they, the Feeding America food bank can work with my team to flip some switches on the back end and which sort of en enables our algorithms so that instead of the food bank receiving that notification about what probably is a smaller donation than what these several hundred thousand square feet of warehouses and full service organizations might, might typically handle, it would get pushed to one of their um, smaller soup kitchen or food pantry partners, and they can then go pick them up, pick up that food and bring it back to serve. In addition to that, they can also manage, the food bank can manage those hundreds of connections between grocery stores and those food pantries that exist in those communities for the scheduled reoccurring pickups. And they can even uh, enact volunteer drivers that have been vetted and trained by the food bank to go pick up food and deliver it once a food business posts those donations. It's 100% free to use, which is always, I always neglect to say, and I should lead with that. I'll probably learn one of these days, but it's, it, we're not trying to make money. Food Meal Connect is 100% free for um, anybody that wants to use it. Next slide. So again, as mentioned, we are these this, these figures are a little out of date. So we are just about at three billion pounds rescued, which is pretty pretty heady stuff. We've been around since 2014 and transacted about 6.5 million donations across Meal Connect, engaging over 9,300 hunger relief organizations around the country, topping probably by this point 33,000 donor locations. And as we think about Meal Connect as a labor saving device for our Feeding America network, probably starting to tip the scales at over 17,000 work days saved. Those are, time, those are days that would have been spent doing coordination work or data entry, and now they can be out in the community. Those folks can be out in the community developing and, 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 and nurturing relationships with, with donors. I'm always proud to talk about General Mills, Google.org, and Walmart Foundation as uh, foundational partners and sponsors of the work. They've all donated and sponsored us several times, so that's a huge compliment, I feel, to, to where we're going and where we're taking Meal Connect, and uh, which is kind of a good segue. So next slide. So where we're taking Meal Connect, and I suppose this is why, and <clears throat> not, not the prettiest looking slide, but what I wanted to show here is that you know, Meal Connect has been around since 2014, but right around a year ago, once COVID hit and the economy was shut down and the supply chain, the nation's supply chain started to contract, obviously everyone remembers all those stories about farms and growers having to dump or at least not or destroy um, all that all the crops in their in their fields because not even the local Feeding America food bank could take on that that food because they were already their warehouses were already filled. And at the same time, at those Feeding America food banks, you had miles of lines of cars miles long of people waiting to get a charitable food assistance because, because of the, the economic situation. That incredible supply demand imbalance sort of caused us uh, on the Meal Connect team to take action and to, we realized that we had an opportunity with our national scale and infrastructure to make some pivots to expand and to, to lean in a little bit more. So next slide. So this is where we are now. So Meal Connect today, I just spoke to you all about that. And now uh, a year later, we are on the precipice of launching this sort of what we're calling Meal Connect 2.0 for, for lack of a better term, because we're agile. So there's not a real, real release, formalized release schedule like that. But what we are gonna do is expand Meal Connect to an omni-channel food offering and ordering uh, capabilities. So that really means um, now produce growers that have truckloads of product that can travel across 
state lines across regions um, can be offered up to the entire Feeding America network. It can now Meal Connect will be able to handle complex multi multi pick multi drop loads so that they can pick up from a couple of different donors, drop at a couple of different food banks, and really start to maximize the capacity of our food banking network. Same thing with peer to peer sharing that scenario I talked about where a food bank can't take any more produce uh, because their, their stock room is all filled up. Now they can say yes to that food. They can post it on Meal Connect themselves and offer those loads out to the, their peer food banks so that the food bank in Appalachia can have access to all of the surplus produce and citrus coming out of California, for example. Always, as I mentioned, we're agile, so constantly streamlining, streamlining the, the UI, but now taking a big leap forward in, in design, demand and interest signaling, trying to allow food banks to get more proactive and predictive in what they might need so that other food donors and, and food banks can see what, what's in need in the community and start to offer product proactively that way. Regional offering use cases. So Feeding America not only has food banks and soup kitchens of food pantries, as well as a national office, but we um, have a, a highly evolving state association and produce co-op layer to our network, and um, we wanted to expand Meal Connect to offer them uh, a digital place in our network so that they can offer and so offer produce to our food banks and better support them, as well as expanding our integration points. So we do have open APIs. We've got RESTful API connections, and now we are striving to connect with a retailer's inventory system so that once food is designated to be donated, Meal Connect automatically receives the signal about that and can turn it into a donation for somebody to take action on. Similarly with big B2B online marketplaces, same thing. Transportation boards, we can punch out to Uber Freight or to a Convoy and better secure transportation at lower costs. Just really, really pushing forward with this new release. So next slide. So as I mentioned, I probably went a little overboard here, but here's our architecture diagram and tech stack. So the front end is AngularJS and the back end is a .NET framework. And basically everything else is in our Azure environment, um, which is hosted uh, and managed at Feeding America. And you can see we've got a, a several different integration points. We, we have multiple systems that, that Meal Connect plays with in, in, internal to our network. So next slide. So uh, with that, thanks very much. Feel free to visit mealconnect.org. You can look me up on LinkedIn. For those of you in the Feeding America network or are working, running a food pantry or soup kitchen, connect with your local Feeding America food bank if you want to learn more or reach out to me directly. So thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the content here today. Thank you, Justin. And yeah, it's an understatement to say the work you do is not simple and it's quite an extensive stack, but for, for good reason, for good purpose. So thank you for sharing and giving us a uh, look behind the curtains for that. And I'm sure some folks have more questions and speaking of questions, they are coming in hot. So head on over to Q&A. Um, if you haven't added your question, now's a great time as we do have a couple more speakers to get to and you can go ahead and upvote your favorite question or your favorite questions, I should say, that'll float them to the top and that will uh, help us pick the ones that we should start with. And also chat is also super hot and on fire right now. Love to see all those comments coming in keep them coming and a reminder to tweet at us. We're at TechSoup and you can use the hashtag food apps and public good app house. All right. And last thing, slides, we will be sharing them and a replay of this event will come at you in the next couple days via your inbox. So do stay tuned for that. Okay. Up next, we have Tom Duner. Tom is a software engineer dedicated to improving people's interactions with government. Currently, he works as a senior software engineer for Code for America, helping thousands of Californians per, per day easily apply for nutrition assistance via getcalfresh.org. We're so glad you're here, Tom. Take it away. Hello, everyone. It's an honor uh, to be presenting about our work at Code for America on Get Cal Fresh to you all. I'm just humbled by the presenters and humbled by all the attendees sharing all of the hard work that you do day in and day out for to, to address food insecurity. My name is Tom, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a senior software engineer at Code for America. At Code for America, we believe that the two biggest levers for improving people's lives at scale are technology and government, and we put them together. 
Our Get CalFresh team works every day to provide food security to Californians by supporting applicants through the Get Cal through the CalFresh enrollment process. So if you're not familiar, uh, SNAP is the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, sometimes colloquially known as food stamps. And CalFresh is the branded name of SNAP in California. SNAP provides roughly $60 billion annually to low-income families across the country. For a family of four, SNAP can provide a maximum of about $646 in benefits per month to spend on groceries. But California has the fifth worst participation rate in SNAP in the country, participation meaning of the percentage of people who are eligible, the number that are actually enrolled. Over 5.4 million Californians are eligible but not receiving CalFresh benefits. So our goal is to fully close the CalFresh participation gap and ensure that every Californian who is eligible has a dignified experience accessing much needed food benefits. Next slide. Why does this participation gap exist? This is an animation of applying for CalFresh using My Benefits CalWin, the system you would see in about half of California's counties. It's 52 pages full of confusingly worded questions. And I'm guessing this is no surprise to some of the food bank workers uh, that are in the audience today. This slide, I will admit this slide is actually seven years old. I copied this from one of the very first presentations ever given about CalFresh. And I was debating even putting it in here, but it felt right because of how little the system has improved over that time. When the existing application process looks like this, we can use technology to show a better way. Next slide. And so that's why we built Get CalFresh. This is a human-centered, mobile-friendly, dignified way to apply for SNAP in all of California's 58 counties. We've helped well over 3 million Californians so far receive CalFresh, 3 million. And we have scaled up our capacity dramatically to help clients during COVID. In 2020, we helped more people obtain CalFresh than the last five years combined. We use our unique role in the ecosystem to partner with counties and community organizations to show what's possible to create a dignified experience for our clients. So with a little bit of luck, we'll have this demo uh, video that I filmed on my phone. Yes, thank you, Nicole, for the tech assist. Get CalFresh acts as a digital assister, supporting users through each step of the eligibility and enrollment process on their mobile phone or desktop. An online application for CalFresh takes 55 minutes or more using the old system. Get CalFresh has managed to reduce that to about eight minutes on average for our users. Every question is user tested and is designed to be as straightforward as possible. In this recording, I, I just made this on my phone the other day. I was able to submit the application in four minutes. Now you add some time for uploading some verification documents, but you can really see the benefit of human-centered design in showing a radically simpler, more humane way to enroll in benefit programs. But what you're seeing here is just the first step. Over the seven years of Get CalFresh, we've expanded into supporting community-based organizations like food banks and other organizations in the community to assist people with enrollment. We've rolled out new features. We've rolled out features to allow our clients to renew and maintain their benefits as easily as it is to apply to begin with and to communicate with counties to upload missing verification documents. And to even, this is uh, what I'm most proud of lately, is to recover food that was lost to natural disasters. You've seen in the news a lot of unfortunate natural disasters affecting California. And so now we support kind of re uh, recovering some of the, replacing those benefits. On the tech side, CalFresh is built, Get CalFresh is built with the Ruby on Rails web framework and extensively uses Selenium, Twilio, and Mailgun to communicate with our clients and with our county systems that we integrate with. At Code for America, we're big fans of boring technology. We don't, you know, we don't keep it exciting very often, but that allows us to focus on shipping great features without technology becoming a bottleneck. Because after all, Get CalFresh is about the client experience. Uh, we want to close the SNAP participation gap in California. So although yes, we build technology, we also build partnerships. We build a lot of prototypes and we build some policy proposals as well. We want CalFresh to be the best program it can be for community-based organizations, for government staff, and most importantly, for whoever may need the benefit for their family tomorrow. Um, so if we could go back to the slides, I guess we made it about halfway through um, the application in the time that I said all that. And the last, and lastly, so Code for America, we're around. You can learn more about our work at codeforamerica.org. 
I should also plug, we have a network of 80 community organizations, volunteers throughout the country who meet up regularly to work on issues like food security in their communities. They're called Code for America Brigades. You can learn more about that at our website as well. And uh, if you like combining technology and government, join us for our virtual Code for America Summit this year on May 12th and 13th. And early bird tickets are available for, for 25 bucks at codeforamerica.org slash summit. And so with that, and on behalf of the 30 of my teammates whose work went into everything you just saw today, thank you very much for your time. Hey, thank you, Tom. And I think something we hear a lot amongst our public good app house speakers is human-centered design, right? And design thinking, best practices. And we saw too, the folks that we have on the line with us today are empathetic, compassionate. I think that comes naturally of really putting ourselves in the user's situation and the user's shoes and being able to design from that perspective. So definitely want to answer some questions and some questions that I've seen around how do we do good interviews that really identify those gaps. So I bet a lot of you have really good responses to that. So we'll get to that in Q&A. Q &A. Stick around, everyone. We're, we're getting there. But last but not least, really excited to have Jonathan Sue. Jonathan is the front end engineer for Open Meal, and he aspires to use his technical expertise to drive positive change and social impact. So let's hear more about Open Meal. Take it away, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan, and I'm super hum humbled to be able to speak alongside everyone here doing amazing things to help solve food insecurity. And today I'm going to be representing Open Meal, a California-based nonprofit supporting local restaurants and individuals affected by COVID-19. Next slide. We're all not strangers to the effects that COVID-19 has had on our community. And some of us may know someone who has lost their job or been financially impacted by the recent pandemic. And in July, it was reported that 31.3 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Food banks and soup kitchens are overwhelmed and are seeing long lines around the block. As a result, 60% of restaurants have closed their doors due to lost business. Family restaurants with long traditions and roots in local communities have been forced to shut down. Uh, next slide, please. We truly believe that everyone deserves a delicious meal to look forward to. And we grew deeply concerned for both the families in need and struggling business owners. So we built Open Meal, a nonprofit that bridges the gap between individuals in need and restaurants facing closure. Next, uh, with a team of volunteers, we built a techno technologically driven solution to build a safety net for our community. Open Meal is a 501c nonprofit that sponsors meals from restaurants facing closure to feed those in need. Next. And we have a simple model with a big impact. Here's how it works. Donors can contribute to a universal pool of funds. Individuals in need of food sign up and become weekly diners who receive $20 of meal credits from any of our partnered restaurants. Like any food delivery apps such as Uber Eats or Grubhub, diners can use the Open Meal app to order their meal of preference at any of our partnered restaurants. And at the end of each week, we use donations to pay the restaurants for the meals that were ordered. Next slide, please. Open Meal relieves financial burden by giving meal credits to individuals struggling with food insecurity. Unlike standard food banks that give pre-made meals and supplies, we give diners back their autonomy by giving them the freedom to order a meal of choice from a variety of restaurants. Um, next. So this is kind of how it works. Our users are given credits. They then are able to place orders using these credits. And finally, they can pick up and enjoy their favorite meal. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so here's a short demo of how a user would order meals using our platform. After logging into their account, they'll be redirected to our dashboard uh, next, where they'll be able to browse our partnered restaurants Using tools like our search and filter tools, they can quickly find restaurants they're looking for. And every restaurant has a weekly limit of accumulated donations. This is to make sure that 
no singular restaurant gets all of the donations and that we're also helping out all of our partnered restaurants. Next. After clicking a restaurant, a diner will be able to add menu items to their cart and the added items will be displayed within the cart. They can change the number of items they want for whatever particular item that they are ordering and diners can proceed to the checkout stage when they're ready. Next. And on the checkout page, diners can schedule their desired pickup time and date and view the restaurant's location and ultimately place an order. Next. After the order is placed, the diner will be given an order number, which they can use to verify their order upon pickup. So they would typically go to the restaurant and then show the pickup number to, or the confirmation number to the restaurant. They would verify it and then give them the meal. And diners are also allowed to provide an optional thank you note to our generous donors. So for our tech stack in the front end, we use React, JS, TypeScript, and Tailwind CSS. In our back end, we use Flask and Postgres SQL for our database, and both of which are hosted on Heroku. And next slide. With that said, OpenMeal has a long journey ahead of us, and we're really thankful to be able to share this exciting initiative with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Really appreciate hearing about that. Again, another perspective, another path to creating more solutions for food security. So we appreciate you and all of our brilliant speakers who are here on the screen, who are here with us today to now get to your questions. Um, so we're gonna get there in just a bit. A reminder, you can add your question to Q&A. That's the best place. We've already got some excellent questions. To find Q&A, you'll see two message bubbles on your Zoom menu that's the best place to add them. And you'll also get a chance to upvote your favorite questions. And um, we'll try to get to some of the questions that are in chat, but if you put a question in chat, move it over to Q&A, more likely that we will see it there. Okay, and also a reminder that we will be sharing the replay from today's event. In addition to slides and any links that we might've shared with you in chat, we'll do our best to bundle that up into an email and send it over to you within the next couple of days here. And that's also going to include some information about a very special addressing food insecurity tweet chat that's happening February 10th. So you definitely want to look out for that email. Okay, now it's time to head into Q&A. So again, head on over to the Q&A bubble, um, see what questions have been asked, upvote your favorites, add your own. And we're going to kick things off here with this first question. We're going to go around the table. And I'm just going to start with Kamale here and then we'll move to Josh and so on. Why did you choose to focus on your particular area of food insecurity? Like, how did you decide to focus on this particular problem, maybe in this particular way? If you can talk a little bit about that, that origin story. Sure. So as we're part of WFP, the World Food Program, the World Food Program's mandate is to fight global hunger. And so this is a directive that comes from the United Nations, the board of the, all the countries who say, you are to be the first ones on the ground to, to help solve global hunger. And so Share the Meal has always been a part of WFP. We were born within the organization and have always remained in the organization. So we're kind of in a startup within this very traditional UN space. And so we have the same mandate. But I think what I like to say is that we are the cool, sexy brand at WFP, where, you know, our MO is to engage millennials in the fight against hunger. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, people are very used to writing checks, giving uh, money directly out of their paycheck through their employer, dropping coins in a bucket in a grocery store. But we're here to disrupt that and make charitable giving easy. So we're here not just to have our app, but also to extend charitable giving outside of the app. So whether it's through an API, through one of our partners, or through you know a home uh, security system to say, hey Siri, share a meal. That's what we're looking to do. So we are here to fight hunger, and that's that's our mandate. How about let's uh, move on over to Josh. Uh, why did you choose to focus on this particular area or this particular solution? For me, it was realizing how much waste there was at the grocery store level, and at one point. As I was digging into the problem before I started the company, I talked to a whole bunch of people and one of them was an executive in a grocery store. And they're like, look, 
we donate a ton of food, like, like thousands or whatever, a lot of pounds, a lot of food. And then we'll show up a week later at the food bank and it's just sitting there rotting on their shelves because they haven't been able to get it out in time or there weren't enough people that week or there was bad weather. So people didn't come to pick up and that's kind of, and then this executive is like, we pay the cost of getting it there. So how can we continue to donate all of this food? And I'm like, okay, this is a logistics problem. The problem is around who picks it up, who drops it off, who pays the price, who guarantees the safety. It really is a logistics problem. And I just thought if there's a way to solve this at the store level by driving people to the store who will in turn buy more food while they're at the store, like there's value there for the grocer. And if we can get this to scale, then we can start to solve this for other stakeholders in the value chain. And I just, we zeroed in on that and we stayed completely focused on grocery because if you prove concept in a few locations, they'll give you their whole banner. And I just thought that was the, for me and, and how I was looking at it, I thought that was the biggest impact that I could have at scale. So that's why we decided to stay at the grocery level. Justin, your thoughts on focus area. Sure. So kind of like commonly, I working at Feeding America is, you know, we've been around for about 45 years or so. So there already is a nationwide sort of physical infrastructure of food banks and soup kitchens and food pantries, kind of kind of just doing what, what Josh mentioned of, you know, doing the work of going out and, and collecting donated groceries and manufacturing donations and that kind of thing. But after working at Feeding America for a short time, I had, had a boss who was kind of a champion, I suppose, for me and had this idea that it, it even though it was the 21st century, food banking was still sort of in the 20th century. And we sort of workshopped how we might leverage technology to facilitate those changes, to modernize it, to kind of speed up the volume and velocity of food pushing through our network, to increase visibility about information that about donated food, where it is, where it needs to go, how, it might, how we might shorten the distance between the two. And started with a, a small team and a real small budget and just started to provide value. And again, got some internal buy-in and started to push out and, and grow. I have kind of a bootstrap mentality. And so again, sort of like with Kamali, we sort of became a startup within this 40-year-old organization. And, and now, you know, now there's a lot of network buy-in, not just the national office, but things are really pushing forward. And, and now my team is getting pushed by, by people in the network for us to do more and more and more. So it's really gratifying, but I think that was it. Sort of seeing, seeing, where the introduction of technology could improve existing processes and make it easier for people at food banks, soup kitchens, and food pantries to do the work that they normally do. Thanks, Justin. On to you, Tom. Focus area. How'd you decide? Yeah, so I guess I'll tell a little bit of a story before before I joined the team. I haven't been on the Get Cow Fresh team very long, but uh, kind of what Justin ended on using technology to improve a process are the, the founders of the Get Cow Fresh product, Jake, Allen, and Dave, they, about seven years ago, they found themselves between jobs and, you know, they had been doing like some fellowships, but essentially nothing that like gave them kind of financial security. So they found, found themselves between jobs without you know, without income. So they were themselves applying for, for SNAP. And they experienced that, that it was just a, a, a bad experience for the millions of people that go through it. And, but they, unlike many folks, you know, they had nothing else to do with their time and they had a technology background. So they kind of applied those skills to trying to make a better approach. The first version of Get Calfresh was a Google form. It was a form where we asked just folks to submit their information and Google's answering my question now that the people submit their information. We advertised it via Google ads and it, and essentially built up the product from there. So essentially like a true agile, like definitely what's the minimum amount that we could do to like make this experience, this process better with technology. And then from there, you know, that kind of gives us a hook to like start from to then build and layer on top of to then make it more formalized, handle the errors, build the partnerships, do all these things to turn it into like an institution. And so that's what we've been doing the last seven years. Thanks, Tom. And Jonathan, focus area, how would you decide? Awesome. Thank you for the question. Well, I think the main thing is Open Meal was created in response to COVID-19. And our founders saw that 
you know, because of COVID-19, a lot of individuals and small businesses, especially minority owned businesses and those the lower like economic like class were struggling a lot with food insecurity and also like businesses just staying uh, afloat. So then Open Meal was created to maybe try to help keep both of those parties afloat. And we try to do that by connecting both of them. So it'd be mutually beneficial, but then also by trying to garner as much donations as possible so that we can help those in need. So, yep, you're on mic. There I am. I'm back. I found my voice. Thanks for that round, everyone. Let's let's move to this question here. In-house versus vendor tech teams. So Wesley noticed that most of the presenters have in-house product development teams. Is that because in-house is the only way? And has anyone sustained an app using an external vendor? That's a great question. Whoever would like to take that one first. I, I have a story here that I think will be useful. So we started with literally nothing. And our first developer that we had, so I went on, on Upwork, which is like a website where you can hire developers internationally and posted a job. And we ended up having a developer work on the first version of the app. And the developer's name was Nazima. And we would only talk through Skype. This was in 2016. We'd only talk through Skype. They were based in China and they had a picture uh, of a female as their like icon. And we would never talk voice. We would never talk video, only through text. And they could barely speak English. <laughs> and this developer got the first version of our app built, which barely worked. And then I met my CTO and he did an audit on the app. And he's like, because we had our first grocer that was going to run a pilot with us. And my CTO now is like, I don't know if this is going to work or not. I, I, like it, Actually, the whole thing might break. And so I just kind of crossed my fingers and we did the first pilot with the first grocer. We ended up getting really good metrics and shut it down within a week. And uh, that was our first developer that we had. Then we raised a little bit of money and started doing it in-house. But the reason why I mentioned the icon image being a woman is because if you reverse Googled the image of the icon that this developer had, it was actually a famous actress in China. So I have no idea who built the first version of our app a couple of years ago. And like, thank God it worked because it got us like the first few steps of where we are now. So that was my first experience with development. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah, I think we've all probably many many folks here starting at different stages and would love to hear more stories uh, from other speakers here in terms of in-house versus vendor tech teams. What was your path? Well, we sort of have a hybrid of the two. We have, you know, I manage a technology team at Feeding America that's more product management, QA, you know, sort of user operations, user engagement, UI and UX design. But the, we've got, we work with a small team of full stack developers that's offsite and have done so since 2014. And I, I know that we're by far their, their largest customer. But working through Agile, I mean, they really are our partner. They're not our vendor and we're not their customer. We really are partners. You know, we, there's frequent, if not constant contact. And so it feels like they are an extension of our team and not, not a vendor. So for folks who are sort of exploring something like that, I, I would look for a, a, a vendor that's more of a partner than somebody that you are just sort of giving business requirements to and asking them to go off in a corner and build it uh, in isolation. Yeah, anyone else want to react to this question? I'll, um, I'll add as well. Yeah. Uh, ahead, before you that. As I mentioned, all of our, our tech and product is in-house. And I think for us, you know, we made that decision early on that we are a product first company, sure the meal that is and, and not WFP. But I think for us, it's really helped the entire team. I mean, of course, we have a marketing operations partnerships team, but it's really helped us connect with what we're doing. And even we've had something as simple as in the past Tuesdays, we would have bugs and croissants. So we would sit together as a team and whoever found a bug got a croissant <laughs> after the app and looking through the app. And so I think even something as simple as that has really helped the whole team connect. As I said, I, I'm not an engineer by any means, but I've learned how, how the product works and, and 
how what we're doing yeah ticks so can recommend the bugs and croissants idea because it's a really nice uh team bonding experience as well (laughs) well that's making me hungry jonathan you had something to add there yeah definitely so the interesting thing about open meal is that we're completely volunteer based so we actually have people all around the world you know if they want to uh, volunteer and help out they can and everything's online so you know we share a get a repo and everyone is able to contribute from everywhere around the world. We have someone actually even in Malaysia. And I don't, I don't know if you would call it in-house or vendor, I guess, because we, we all work in a team together. I guess it would be in-house, but just a pretty interesting like question now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Tom's going to say I mean, I? in-house all the way, <laughs> right? Yeah, so we, we are in-house at Code for America, occasionally, you know, using some contract support. And so we've thought a lot about this as an organization over time and kind of our, there are different models, right? And especially like we think about it a lot in terms of like government, like what is the best way for government to build this technology so that we don't have to do it as ourselves, essentially, we want to not be necessary. So the there are different models. There's the volunteer net, the volunteer model, Jonathan just mentioned. And also, I think I... I alluded to in one of the Q and A's, I accidentally answered. There's a little discussion going about high school students from Peter in Los Angeles. And so just kind of, you know, a little plug for our our, our volunteer network. But I think there are different trade-offs to different models. And as a nonprofit, you've kind of like, as like an attendee of this workshop, you know, you've, I I think to some extent you've got to do, take what you can get. And maybe it's a faceless volunteer from China who is doing, good work for you, but like, you know, is, is, but, you know, of questionable code quality, you know, I think whatever is going to get your project off the ground, you've got to go with. And, you know, if you don't have the budget for a tech team in-house, like that's going to be the most expensive way, right? Like tech people are expensive. So yeah, you got to do what you got to do. And so there's definitely trade-offs and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that many organizations on this call have had a lot more personal experience with those trade-offs, but, but yeah, for, I guess what I will say for Code for America, and we we have chosen to do the development ourselves to build our product teams, because that allows us to focus on building the products how we want to build them. It's not just a, here are the business requirements, make it happen kind of deal. Like that is, that's an interface where, you know, you have to explicitly list out every product requirement you want to hit. We can't do that. Like we don't know in advance, like all of that stuff. We want to listen to the users. We want to be able to iterate very quickly. So that just lends itself better to kind of bringing on staff fundraising for the staff to be able to do that. All right. We've got about 10 more minutes for questions here. Keep those questions coming. Head on over the Q and a it's two message bubbles uh, in your zoom menu. And that is the place where you can see all the other questions that have been asked and vote for your favorites. So I know there's a lot of good questions and we're going to do our best. We definitely won't be able to get to all of them. I apologize for that, but I've seen a couple of questions that I want to consolidate here around accessibility. So first starting with language and then starting with accessibility for people who are hearing vision uh, impaired. So yeah, we're going to kind of put that together just in terms of thinking about how are you, how are your apps, how are your solutions addressing languages, are in addressing diverse abilities, and whoever would like to start there, kick it off. I can start. Since we are a global app, the Share the Meals available everywhere besides China. And I... <sighs> Localization has been very challenging. Talk about what you have in-house and what you don't have in-house. We don't have localization in-house. We work with a team of volunteers and we have 14 languages. And so it's a lot of maintenance and upkeep. And we're actually going through an an internal audit right now to understand what languages make sense and, and what don't to keep in the app. And so it's, it's very challenging. I would say for us, what has a, a bigger effect on do- donors and, and conversion is what currencies we have available. Oftentimes, you know, English can be used or German as one of our larger markets, for example, for simple actions like the word donate or feed a child is, is very simple. But if the currency for the donor is not available, that can pose a challenge. And so I think that's something that if, if anyone is interested in doing, it's it's a big lift, not just on products, but on marketing operations. And it's it's been a challenge for us, but I think also, you know, a, a big success. I would say 
of the 14, probably five really have an impact on our business and the rest are, are not as impactful. I can go next. We are available in English, French, and Spanish, and localization is really difficult. Accessibility is also incredibly important. So I believe Google and Apple have standards now around accessibility or best practices. We had a product meeting about this maybe a month ago, and we're, other than being conscious and cognizant of working towards this, I don't have any other more con concrete things that we're doing. Also, I'll share that like that first version of the app that I talked about was like dead and gone a long time ago. We built from scratch after that and have a team at house. So I wanted to clarify that too for everybody. Get CalFresh thinks a lot about this as well. Um, we follow as closely as we can the web content accessibility guidelines, um, which is a set of standards for um, improving the ability of you know, deaf users or hard of hearing users. Uh, to access or blind users. And, but I think what we, the way that we kind of approach accessibility is out of an inclusion lens. Like we know that, that, you know, some of the most systemically uh, like marginalized or kind of groups, groups of Americans who have been most excluded from these programs are often those um, who don't speak English or who don't have tech familiarity. So we, we, we try to include those, those folks in our work as much as possible. And so, yeah, we do translate our app into Span uh, Spanish and, Ch and simplified Chinese. Unfortunately, we don't have, you know, more languages than that. There are, I think, many hundreds of languages that are spoken in the Bay Area alone. So we have a lot of work to do on that front. But then we also go beyond just making the product available, but we also measure the impact of those communities in terms of how they're able to use our product. So I'm just looking at a graph here that just like we found out that it takes um, twice as long to apply if, in, via, if you're in our Spanish language app. And um, we just kind of uh, discovered that from our metrics that we will be kind of investigating why, you know, kind of what, what leads it to be the, what leads that to be the case. So just kind of like understanding how folks from different communities are using, are benefiting from your products, I think is, is super, or your, you know, are interacting with your organization is, is super important as well. Yeah, other thoughts on accessibility and language? Yeah, for Open Meal, we're definitely still working on the accessibility aspect of our app. Being a volunteer-based company, it's we, there's a lot of things that we want to get done, although like we don't have the bandwidth for it. Right now, we currently only support English, but we try as best as we can to, you know, follow like web accessibility, good practices, so that screen readers can read our website. But aside from that, yeah, it's something that we're still working towards. All right, so we just have a few more moments here for questions and definitely want to get to call to actions. What can and should people who are tuning in today do when they get off this call or sometime this week, sometime in the near future? We're gonna share those in just a bit here. First, let's see, do you all share your code on GitHub? Other states might be able to adapt. And I just wanna tie into this question that I saw for, let's see here, looks like this will probably be for Tom. Could Code for America help other states like Colorado? So I think this all kind of comes back to do, come, comes back to how can this be replicated? GitHub, can other orgs pull, pull your code? And, and what other kind of services do you have to, to use what you've already created, your learnings as a foundation for other organizations? Maybe I'll, I'll start. The, is this the call to act, the overall call to action question? Not yet. Not okay. yet. Just getting right, you guys warmed that. up for it. Before right, that. Yes. Okay. So my hot take is no, it can't be replicated by forking the code base. That That is not like, so first off, we are working on open sourcing Git Calfresh. We, it, 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 has, it has been a long project to, because we started at closed source. And so we're working on that. The hard part about replicating most civic technology projects, in my experience, is not the code. It's the relationships. It's the context surrounding the code. So, so Code for America, this is a good time to plug some of our other work. We do have an integrated benefits initiative, which is working in Colorado, I believe, and has and we have a portfolio of work of which Cal Get CalFresh is one piece that seeks to replicate the work in a more general sense than a literal copy paste of the code. 
So yes, we are trying, we are continuing to work across the country, but it is difficult to do it from an open source perspective, we found. Right. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Any other things that can be replicated in other regions, states? Is that something that your solutions have provided resources for? I see Justin off mute. Well, I was just <laughs> you on the say, spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's a great question. And the reason why I kind of pulled my hand back from muting myself, from unmuting myself was because, you know, Meal Connect is nationally available and it's, re- it's replicatable by being locally implemented by Feeding America Food Banks in, in every state. And so, so in that regard, I guess the tech isn't uh, replicable um, because you need to have the infrastructure in in place, I suppose, to make that happen. We've had conversations with other food food recovery networks in other countries. And honestly, the the mechanisms that exist in in this country besides Feeding America's physical infrastructure, but the incentives, the tax incentives to donate rather than destroy and and a range of other business incentives to, to, to donate their charitable food simply don't exist. So, so, so when I think about replicating in other states, not really applicable to, to Meal Connect and Feeding America, when I think about repl- replicating in other countries, not, not entirely just because the, the infrastructure and the incentives don't exist in the same way as in the United States. Yeah, that's right. I know a lot of your tools are already thinking about how to be implemented locally and commonly. I saw you come off mute. Maybe you wanted to share your reaction on that too. Yeah, I, I would say the same as Justin is that it's not necessarily the, the code that's hard to replicate, but it's the the way that we're feeding beneficiaries. I mean, for us, you know, we we've created code that accepts payments and, and then gets them to the WFP bank account. And then then that's the hard part that really happens is how how does WFP feed 80, uh, 100 million people a year? And so I think that you know, we, we would love to see people replicate, you know, and, and make charitable giving easy and, and engage more folks and, and giving back, be it hunger, climate change, poverty, you know, whatever cause. But I, but I think it's that, you know, end result of, of how are we helping beneficiaries that that's really the, the challenging aspect. Hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's see. I think this is a good segue to move into our call to action. So we're going to go round table again, and we're going to start it with you, Kamale, on terms of what can people here today do moving forward? What would you like to see them do? Get the app, <laughs> share the meal, iOS and Android, and check it out. Also, I know a lot of people on the call here do have a tech background and, and a food background as well. So we'd love to hear your feedback. You know, we're, we'd love for you to give 80 cents, but also tell us what you think about the product. We're always improving and trying to make it accessible for everyone. So, you know, feel free to connect with me and I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. For us, it's go tell your local grocers that they should be on flash food. That's it. Straightforward, simple. Justin, what's your call to action? Well, short, well, in addition to going to milkconnect.org and, and just sort of championing that in your local community, I would say go go volunteer, plug in to local food rescue, even if you're uh, a techie or you, or, you know, or, or you are sort of in an, in an adjacent space, there's nothing like participating. That said, I'll also give a, a plug. My team's looking for a DevOps engineer. So if anybody knows of one or is one themselves looking to do some really great work, reach out to me either on LinkedIn or I think my contact information is here. I'd love to love to chat with you. Thanks, Justin. Tom, I know you have an event coming up. Anything else you want to plug? Yeah, come to our come to our summit uh, if you're interested. I think just a general call to action for folks who are non-technical or technical, but but I think just a general call to action. Think of the think of the government processes that could be better with technology, and how and especially ones that impact um, you know people in in such an important way as food security and and find find a way to partner with your local code for america brigade to to you know to, to kind of work on that issue they they would love to work with you i see a couple of folks from brigades i see brendan from An- from anchorage code for anchorage up here so there's a few different there's all over the country everywhere from alaska to florida there will be these local groups that are 
looking for partners to solve big problems with. So, so find yours. I think codeforamerica.org has a, has a list, so. Thanks, Tom. And Jonathan, what's your call to action? My call to action is if you guys could check out our web app and, you know, just take a look, spread the word and yeah, just get the, get the initiative out there. I think like we just want to spread awareness for like what we're trying to do and hopefully get some people to help support us because our company is completely volunteer based and we need donations to, you know, help those in need. Additionally, if anyone is interested in joining our engineering team, we use, you can see the tech stack that we use within the slides, but yeah, if you are interested, we will definitely like to look at your application. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. And again, a round of snaps for all of our speakers, for Amanda, for everyone on our panel. We so appreciate you being here with us. We've got a lot of work to do. We can do it together, whether we're technical, non-technical, we all have a role to play. We all have a way to plug in. 